From New York, this is Democracy Now! His wife, his children, his mother should have him here right now. That's what's more important. He should still be here right now. When you call for help, you should get help. You shouldn't get execution. Hundreds took to the streets of Philadelphia for a second night Tuesday to protest the police killing of Walter Wallace Jr., a 27-year-old black man who was shot and killed by two Philadelphia police officers in front of his mother while he was having a mental health crisis. The National Guard have been ordered into the streets. We'll go to Philadelphia to speak with Professor Mark Lamont Hill about the police killing and President Trump's call for poll watchers in Pennsylvania. Is the president sanctioning voter intimidation? Then we go to Chile where voters have overwhelmingly approved rewriting Chile's Pinochet dictatorship-era constitution following a year of mass protests. This is the beginning and the end. We are giving birth to a new constitution, and we are leaving behind the constitution of Pinochet and his entourage. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The United States recorded nearly 75,000 new coronavirus cases Tuesday, as the confirmed death toll from COVID-19 nears 227,000. The U.S. has recorded over a half a million new coronavirus cases over just the last week. More than half of states are at or near record levels of infections. No state in the union is seeing a decline in new cases. Despite the grim news, the Trump administration declared victory over the coronavirus on Tuesday. In a news release accompanying the release of a 62-page report, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy cited, quote, ending the COVID-19 pandemic as one of President Trump's first-term accomplishments. In Wisconsin, health officials reported 64 coronavirus deaths and nearly 5,300 new daily cases Tuesday, shattering all previous records. Just hours after that announcement, President Trump rallied his supporters in western Wisconsin, where thousands packed shoulder to shoulder at a campaign event where few people wore masks. President Trump said Tuesday any deal on a new stimulus bill would have to wait until after the November election. Trump's comments came after Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell adjourned the Senate until November 9th, following Monday's vote to confirm Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. This comes as more than 54 million U.S. residents are struggling to afford food, according to the hunger relief organization Feeding America. Here in New York, the food bank operates or City Harvest says two and a half million people do not have enough money for basic necessities. This is Guillermo Lugo, manager of a food distribution market in the Bronx. The average of this market was about 200, 250 families. Since the onset of the pandemic, the average attendance at this market is 650 families, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. In Philadelphia, hundreds of people took to the streets for a second straight night Tuesday to protest the police killing of Walter Wallace, Jr., a 27-year-old black man who was shot and killed by two Philadelphia police officers Monday while having a mental health crisis. Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf called out the National Guard to help quell the protest after some people set fires and broke into businesses. On Tuesday evening, Walter Wallace, Sr., called for an end to chaos and looting, but demanded justice for his son. Somebody had to be all accountable for what they did. If you're going to call a justified shooting multiple times, I mean, what kind of law we have? After headlines, we'll go to Philadelphia for the latest on the police killing of Walter Wallace, Jr. Two members of a grand jury convened after the police killing of Breonna Taylor have spoken on camera for the first time, calling the actions of the Louisville officers responsible for Taylor's death criminal.
The two jurors say Kentucky's Republican Attorney General Daniel Cameron never gave them the option to consider murder or manslaughter charges against the Louisville police officers involved in Taylor's killing. The pair had their identities concealed as they spoke with CBS's Gail King in an interview airing today. Can I ask you what you both think of the police uh, behavior and actions that night? Negligent. Negligent? They couldn't even provide a risk assessment, and it sounded like they hadn't done one. Um, so their organization leading up to this was lacking. That's what I mean by they were negligent in, in, in the operation. Number two? They were criminal leading up to this and everything that they, the way they moved forward on it, including the warrant, uh, was deception. A record 71 million early votes have already been cast in the presidential election, surpassing the 2016 early vote count. In Texas, 46 percent of all registered voters have already cast their ballots. On Tuesday, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden campaigned in Georgia, a state not won by a Democrat since Bill Clinton in 1992. Trump campaigned in Nebraska, Wisconsin, Wisconsin and Michigan, where a judge just ruled voters can openly carry firearms at polling places. Trump attacked Michigan Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer again and downplayed a recent right-wing plot to kidnap her. Trump supporters repeatedly chanted, lock her up. He also criticized the media's reporting on the pandemic. And you know, now with them, you can't watch anything else turn on. COVID, 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 well, we have a spike in cases. You ever notice they don't use the word death, they use the word cases, cases, like Baron Trump is a case. He has sniffles. He was sniffling. One Kleenex, that's all he needed. Former President Barack Obama campaigned for Joe Biden in Florida and ridiculed Trump's comments. More than 225,000 people in this country are dead. More than 100,000 small businesses have closed. Half a million jobs are gone in Florida alone. Think about that. And what, what's his closing argument? That people are too focused on COVID. He said this at one of his rallies. COVID, 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 he's complaining. He's jealous of COVID's media coverage. Meanwhile, President Trump continues to attack mail-in ballots, claiming it would be inappropriate to count any ballots received after Election Day. It would be very, very proper and very nice if a winner were declared on November 3rd, instead of counting ballots for two weeks, which is totally inappropriate, and I don't believe that that's by our laws. On Monday, believe... the Supreme Court ruled mail-in ballots in Wisconsin can be counted only if they are received by Election Day. Justice Brett Kavanaugh's concurring opinion has alarmed voting rights advocates. Kavanaugh said counting ballots received after Election Day could create, quote, suspicions of impropriety because they could, quote, potentially flip the results of an election, unquote. One voting rights expert slammed Kavanaugh for adopting a, quote, Trumpian mindset. Meanwhile, many voting rights groups are now urging voters to drop off absentee ballots in person instead of relying on the U.S. Postal Service to deliver them in time, due to cutbacks implemented by the new Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, a major supporter of President Trump. In other voting news, the Texas Supreme Court has backed Republican Governor Greg Abbott order limiting ballot drop box sites to just one per county. Muslim communities around the world are denouncing French President Emmanuel Macron's public backing of caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad, accusing Macron of attacking Islam. Macron made the comments during a vigil for a French teacher beheaded outside his school earlier this month. The teacher had previously shown his students a cartoon of Muhammad. Protests against Macron have erupted across Bangladesh, Palestine, Iraq and other predominantly Muslim nations. Meanwhile, Turkey Turkey, Qatar, Kuwait and others are demanding a boycott of French products. 
The United Nations is warning severe child malnutrition is soaring in Yemen, with nearly 100,000 children now at risk of dying. The food security crisis is being driven by a combination of the U.S.-backed Saudi war, the pandemic, climate change and cutbacks in international aid. Fuad Ahmed Remy is a nurse in Sana'a. We are receiving many malnutrition patients and seeing many deaths caused by the poor economic conditions and the inability of parents to come to the hospital because of poverty. If the aid agencies stop their support, this will lead to a humanitarian disaster for the Yemeni people, who are unable to cope with the economic sanctions and the lack of fuel. The United Arab Emirates has become the first Arab state to open a consulate inside Western Sahara, which has been occupied by Morocco by 45 years, in defiance of the United Nations and the international community. Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council is voting today to renew its mandate to keep a peacekeeping force in the occupied territory. Amnesty International has issued an appeal for the United Nations to include a human rights monitoring component for the peacekeepers. Most independent human rights organizations and journalists are not able to enter Western Sahara. The homes of Right Livelihood laureate Amanatu Haidar and human rights defenders Mina Bale and El Galya Jimi remain under police siege, since they and other activists launched a new organization known as ISACOM that demands self-determination and human rights for the Sahrawis. Visit democracynow.org to watch our special Four Days in Western Sahara, Africa last colony. A teenage activist in Hong Kong was detained by police Tuesday near the U.S. consulate, where he was planning to seek asylum. 19-year-old Tony Chung helped found the pro-independence group Student Localism and had been arrested previously under Hong Kong's new national security law. Two of his associates were also detained on Tuesday. In the Gulf of Mexico, Tropical Storm Zeta has strengthened back into a hurricane ahead of its expected landfall south of New Orleans as a Category 2 storm this afternoon. Officials along Louisiana's Gulf Coast are warning of flooding and life-threatening storm surges. On Tuesday, Zeta struck Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, which was still recovering from Hurricane Delta's landfall just three weeks ago. Zeta is the 27th named storm of the 2020 Atlantic hurricane season, which is on pace to break all records. In New York, Keith Raniere, the leader of the Nexium sex cult, has been sentenced to 120 years in prison for sex trafficking and other charges. Over a dozen women testified at the sentencing hearing, saying Raniere traumatized and brainwashed them while he posed as a self-help guru. One of the survivors said Raniere started sexually assaulting her when she was 15 and he was 45. Others testified Raniere referred to them as slaves and branded them with his initials using a cauterizing pen. A federal judge has ruled President Trump can be personally sued for defamation by E. Jean Carroll, who accused Trump of raping her in the 1990s. The judge rejected an attempt by the Justice Department to switch the defendant in the case from Donald Trump to the U.S. government, claiming Trump's rape accusation denial was done in his official capacity as president. The judge ruled the president is not an employee of the government and that Trump's comments regarding the rape accusation, quote, would not have been within the scope of his employment. And in Poland, protests continue following a constitutional court ruling last week that banned almost all forms of abortion, tightening anti-choice laws that were already among the most restrictive in Europe. Demonstrators took to the streets Tuesday, blocking public transit and streets in one of Warsaw's richest neighborhoods. The truth is that there is going to be a chain of illegal underground abortions now, which means that a lot of them will be conducted in inhumane conditions, completely devastating conditions. Meanwhile, lawmakers opposing the near-total ban on abortion led a protest inside the Polish parliament Tuesday, wearing T-shirts and masks with a lightning bolt symbol representing the women's strike movement. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. When we come back, we will 
go to Philadelphia, where hundreds of people have been protesting in the streets for the last two nights after the killing of an African-American father. Stay with us. It isn't right for too many fallen. They see us in the name of the great good. Oh, we lost sight. World is getting colder. What happened to the words for which we once stood? I will stand for you. Could you stand for me? Everybody deserves to be free. I would lend a hand to you. Could you lend a hand to me? Everybody deserves to be free. It's close to nine, but the leave a kid. Everybody Deserves to be Free, by Resistance Revival Chorus and Eva Mahal. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by my co-host Juan Gonzalez from New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well. This story today, a warning to our audience. It contains descriptions of police violence and disturbing images. Protesters took to the streets of Philadelphia for a second night on Tuesday to condemn the police killing of Walter Wallace, Jr. The National Guard has been deployed to Philadelphia as outrage grows after two Philadelphia police officers shot and killed the 27-year-old black father on Monday, while he was having having a mental health crisis. Both police officers were reportedly wearing body cameras when they shot Wallace. Philadelphia Police Commissioner Danielle Outlaw said Tuesday she does not know if she will release body cam footage of the killing. Wallace's lawyer said Tuesday his family has called for and was calling for an ambulance to help him with a mental health crisis, but police arrived on the scene instead. Cell phone video of the fatal shooting shows Walter Wallace Jr.'s mother trying to restrain him before he pushes her away and walks toward the officers, who then shot Wallace at least 10 times. Police allege Wallace refused to drop a knife he was holding. Wallace was at least 10 feet away from the police officers when they shot him. At least one witness told the Philadelphia Inquirer the officers were, quote, too far from him and said bystanders were trying to de-escalate the situation. On Tuesday, Walter Wallace Jr.'s mother, Kathy Wallace, told reporters the officers knew her son was in a mental health crisis because they'd been to the family's house three times on Monday. Did you tell the police about his condition when you called 911? No, they already know about it. They already know it's already in, 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 on his rockets. They were there earlier in the day, right? Were they there earlier that day? Yeah, they was there early that day, and they were standing out there laughing at us. They wasn't trying to help us. They didn't give a damn about us. And my son said, look at them. They standing there laughing at us. What do you want to do? So I took my son and I walked and I left him standing out there. That's what made my son. We walked down the street and left the cops standing out there. But when we, that's it. I'm done. No. I love y'all. No. I'm tired of you. During Tuesday night's emotional news conference, the Wallace family's attorney, Shaka Johnson, said Wallace's wife, Dominique, who witnessed his killing, is pregnant and scheduled to have labor induced today. Johnson said Wallace had nine children. Several of his young sons introduced themselves. Zamir. What's your name? Zaka Wallace. What's your name, bud? Zana. Z Can you tell us about your dad? Okay, so we need to always hang out 
Are we to always go places? And we to always play around? That's all right, son. Keep it going. Keep going. And He's we strong. Hey, baby. He's strong. You can do it. And he looks to always tell me how to be a man. I'm doing that. Praise God. Praise God. That's right. That's right. And these white racist cops got my own dad. I'm sorry. Because. He's a man's man. And black life still matter. One of the sons of Walter Wallace Jr. He was killed Monday by Philadelphia police. For more, we go to Philadelphia, where we're joined by Mark Lamont Hill, professor of media studies and urban education at Temple University. His forthcoming book, We Still Hear, Pandemic, Policing, Protest and Possibility. He was at Monday night's protest. Mark, welcome back to Democracy Now! Can you talk about everything you understand at this point that has unfolded, beginning with Monday, when the mom said that the police knew full well her son was in a mental health crisis because they'd been to the house three times that day, and they said that night they were calling for an ambulance for him? Right. Well, that, that's exactly the point. When the police began to uh, release their statements and tell their version of events. They left out uh, that they had been to the house three times earlier that day. Uh, they said, oh, we had no way of knowing that he had a mental health episode. One, it was clear from the previous phone calls, uh, but it was also clear from what his mother told them on the scene, uh, not to mention anyone chasing police around a car with a knife or walking. He wasn't actually chasing the police. Walking around with a knife is clearly uh, having an episode. And so from all those elements, it was clear that the police did not respond as if someone were having a mental health episode. Instead, uh, they decided to to shoot him instead of ex exercising de-escalation, any kind of negotiation. Uh, and again, the parents weren't calling the police. They were calling for an ambulance. They were calling for mental health support. And this is part of the fundamental problem of society right now, is that the police become the response to all of our social crises and contradictions. And, Mark, specifically, I wanted to ask you about that. There's so many incidents we've seen, not only over the last year or two, but over decades of uh, police responding to what are, are essentially mental health issues. And of uh, very few cities uh, have the, uh, the structure by which there can be mental health professionals responding. It's always the police, and it always becomes a situation where uh, violence is unfortunately used. That's exactly right. If if all you have is a hammer, then, then every 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 problem looks like a nail, right? It, we, if, if the only solution we have is policing, then we're going to have a militarized and a policing type of and criminalized response to the problem. For decades, what we've seen is a a, a, a a sort of raid of the social resources. We no longer have access to mental health, schooling, housing, education. All these things are taken out of the, of the public good and replaced by more militarization, placed by more policing. And so the police become the response to all of our social problems and crises. The police aren't equipped to do this. The police aren't equipped to handle a situation with, for, for mental health. And we've seen this since the 1970s, when beginning with Reagan and into uh, President Carter's, uh, I'm sorry, beginning with President Carter's administration and entering Reagan's administration, we've seen the, the stripping of mental health resources. And so we see the criminalization of mental health uh, as, as, as mentally ill people end up on the street and then get and then get locked up for loitering. We see the, 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 the killing of, mental, of me, people with mental illness when they have confrontations with police. And in many ways, Juan and Amy, this is more emblematic of the crisis of policing than even when unarmed people die. Because for every George Floyd that gets killed uh, unarmed, there are dozens and hundreds of people with mental illness that are forced to be criminalized and have these types of engagements with law enforcement every single day. Uh, Mark, I wanted to ask you about the response of, of President Trump immediately because of the protests. And also, there was, there was some violence and looting that occurred. But there have been now pretty credible reports that uh, there have been agent provocateurs in many of these protests across the country. Uh, I recommend the article that Counterpunch had early this month that detailed several of these cities, including, they mentioned, in Philadelphia in June, uh, numerous reports circulated that peaceful protests across the state were being infiltrated by white supremacists. And they quoted there the Pennsylvania Human Rights Co Commission director uh, Chad uh, Dion Lassiter, who said, while I saw what 
I saw was a coordinated effort of looting encouraged by white supremacists who hid behind signs demanding justice while promoting anarchy. Could you talk about the uh, the, the violence that has erupted now in the last couple of days as, uh, from these protests and also how President Trump is responding, trying to use what's happened here to say that there are definitely now poll watchers needed in Philadelphia, uh, trying to utilize this violence as part of his campaign in Pennsylvania? Yeah, a couple of things. First, um, yeah, there are agent provocateurs. Uh, we saw it on the ground in Ferguson. I saw it with my own eyes. I saw it in June with my own eyes. I saw it Monday, uh, excuse me, Tuesday with, with or Monday, excuse me, with my own eyes. When, when you look at what's happening on the ground, it's often not uh, the people who are righteously rebelling who are engaged in these wanton acts of reckless violence. Uh, and, and it's important to acknowledge that. It's important to acknowledge that this then becomes the pretext for people like Donald Trump and Governor Wolf, for that matter, calling in more military, calling for more militarization, calling in more police, calling in more troops as a means of engaging in more violence and, and really squelching the dissent. But it's also important to say that even when people on the ground are engaged in acts of of of, of resistance, that this is righteous resistance. I, I, don't, I don't want to simply dismiss all acts of, 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 of pushback and rebellion to, to provocateurs. It's important to say that the state is killing us and we have a right to respond. We have a right to, to, to scar public tissue. We have a right to have our voices heard. These aren't riots. These are rebellions. That's what I talk about in my book, We Still Here. These are rebellions that are intended to force the world to pay attention because no one pays attention to black death unless it affects their money or they think their lives their, or their safety is threatened. I'm not suggesting we go out and kill people. What I am saying, though, is that we have to use some form of resistance, some form of rebellion, if we are to have our voices heard. On that point of the white supremacists, we are seeing one arrest after another, that the initial breaking of the glass, the initial um, uh, fires that are set. And now there are actually arrests of those white supremacists involved. In fact, we talked about this yesterday with Alicia Garza. Um, it was Vice President Mike Pence, um, who, in his Republican na um, National Convention address, uh, brought in the relative of a federal security guard who was killed in Oakland as if he was killed by Black Lives Matter activists, but he was killed by a boogaloo boy who was arrested, and it was well known. Um, but your point uh, is not lost, Mark. Um, how uh, the response to these killings, the responses within the protests, and what you think needs to happen now. Um, I, we were looking at some of your tweets um, over the last days. On Monday, Monday, you wrote, abolition now. Can you talk about Wallace's killing in light of the movement to defund the police? I mean, when, as you said, every, um, every, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I think something like half the city budget of Louisville, and that's, of course, where Breonna Taylor was killed by police, half the budget is for the police. And that's exactly the problem. An, an abolitionist vision, of course, ultimately is a world without policing and prisons, and that builds on the work of critical resistance, the wonderful work of Angela Davis and, and Maria Makaba and, and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and other important black uh, black feminist voice, radical black feminists who encouraged us to have these ambitious sort of freedom dreams of what the world could be. It's important to think about that, but it's not just about what we're getting rid of, it's what we want. We want a world where people's needs are met, where people can have access to jobs, where people can have access to mental health support. And without those things, then we're going to continue to end up with circumstances like this. That's why I say uh, an, ex an, an example like what we see with Walter Wallace is exactly why we need abolition, because the money we're spending for policing should be spent to provide mental health. The money, when people call for defunding, they're saying, what would it mean for some, for a public safety force to come out rather than people, uh, than, than police? What would it mean to have a social worker or a, a therapist on, on the scene and, instead of these police who are trained to shoot first and ask questions later? This is the problem. We need to reimagine what the world looks like and we need to reimagine our social arrangement. For me, that is abolition. So as we fight on the ground, and we saw this in June, we went from a call to abolition to a call to defunding to a call to, to, to integrate police police forces to a call to reform, to police taking knees and members of Congress wearing kente cloth, right? We, we, we've, we've, we've watered down our freedom dream. We've taken the teeth out of the radical demand. We need to return to this vision of, of, of a future without policing and without uh, prisons. And to start, we begin with this defunding. 
Defunding is a step toward abolition if we're doing this the right way. And so in Philadelphia, in Milwaukee, in Louisville, we need to be calling to take money out of police, uh, out of these police force budgets and place them in, in places where people can actually have their needs met. That's the, that's, that's the key here. It's like Kessie Layman says, good love, healthy choices, and second chances. We need a structure that allows for those things to happen. And, and Mark, along that line, how do you assess how the city of Philadelphia has handled this particular uh, the, uh, shooting now of, of Walter Wallace? And often you find uh, progressive politicians, you have supposedly have one in Philadelphia, in Mayor Kenny, uh, and they end up little by little being, uh, being influenced sharply by the enormous power that police unions and their supporters have, whether it's in the city, municipal governments, or at the state level. What do you, how do you see the city handling not only this, uh, this situation, but the whole issue of uh, defunding police? Yeah, uh, Mayor Kenny has has essentially thrown his hands up. Larry Krasner, maybe one of the most progressive district attorneys in the country, I think has made tremendous moves forward. Uh, but the question right now is, how do you engage once there's a police shooting? It's one thing to, to, to decriminalize things. It's one thing to eliminate cash bail. These are all necessary moves toward abolition. But what we have right now is a situation where the police union uh, continues to, to lead a path toward reinforcing militarization, toward justifying bad shoots. We have a black police commissioner who I think, uh, and who I know, um, cares about black people, but again, the, the structure is the problem. And unfortunately, the mayor, the city council, and many people in, in around the city can't imagine a world without policing and prisons. And so we have to reorient them. That means our call on the ground has to be consistent, because what politicians are doing right now is saying, we need community policing. What they're saying right now is we need body cameras. But these are all reform measures that can convince the world that policing as an institution is still a viable possibility. And what we see in the case of Walter uh, Wallace, as opposed to, say, a George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, is that it's not. Because, again, when, when a George Floyd happens, which is a moral atrocity, everybody agrees that that's bad. And they say, let's get rid of the crazy cops that did it. That with Breonna Taylor, they can say, oh, let's get rid of the bad apples. But when you see Walter Wallace Jr. laying on the ground and his mother crying for help as, as the police shoot her baby down in front of them, in front of her, what we see is that the institution of policing is not designed to deal with mental illness or homelessness or domestic violence or, 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 or rape culture or any of the other extraordinary social ills that we wrestle with. We need something different. I want to turn to Election Day, talking mm. about possibly something different or not. In the final week of this election season, both presidential candidates are heavily campaigning in battleground states like Pennsylvania, where you are, where the Supreme Court ruled Friday mail-in ballots with mismatched signatures cannot be rejected. The ruling is seen as a victory for voting rights and Democrats. Republicans in Pennsylvania are now asking the U.S. Supreme Court to take up their case attempting to block the counting of mailed-in ballots received up to three days after Election Day. So far this week, <clears throat> Trump has held three campaign rallies in Pennsylvania. At a rally in Allentown Monday, he accused Democratic Governor Tom Wolf of making it hard for him to campaign in the state and suggested voters cannot trust their ballots will be counted. Think of it. So we have a venue and the governor that counts the ballots, right? The governor counts the ballots. And we're watching you, Governor, very closely in Philadelphia. We're watching you. A lot of bad things. A lot of bad things happen there with the counting of the votes. We're watching you, Governor Wolf, very closely. We're watching you. This comes as the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., has taken to social media to call, quote, able-bodied people to join an election security army for his father. The radical left are laying the groundwork to steal this election from my father, President Donald Trump. They are planting stories that President Trump will have a landslide lead on election night, but will lose when they finish counting the mail-in ballots. Their plan is to add millions of fraudulent ballots that can cancel your vote and overturn the election. We cannot let that happen. We need every able-bodied man, woman to join Army for Trump election security operation.
Pennsylvania's Democratic attorney general, Josh Shapiro, has warned Trump's reelection campaign representatives to stop filming voters dropping off their ballots. Uh, Shapiro said in a statement, quote, Pennsylvania law permits poll watchers to carry out very discreet and specific duties. Videotaping voters at drop boxes is not one of them. For more, we're continuing with Mark Lamont Hill, professor of media studies and urban education at Temple University in Philadelphia. Again, his forthcoming book is We Still Here, Pandemic Policing, Protest and Possibility. Uh, Mark, is the president sanctioning voter intimidation? Clearly, the courts now are moving against him on Pennsylvania. That's exactly right. You know, Trump has been you know, weaving a, a, a kind of really interesting narrative about what's happening in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. He said that Mitt Romney got <laughs> zero votes in Philadelphia, kind of even although he got 15 percent, framing this all as a big uh, left wing conspiracy to take away uh, his presidency. And so when he calls for people to come and form this sort of army, when he calls for people to be his security force, he's calling in his white nationalist base. This is the favor he's calling in. This is the proud boy stand stand back and stand by kind of kind of part two, right? He's calling them in to in, engage in voter intimidation and also to create chaos on election day. Donald Trump very clearly knows the numbers are against him. After the after the uh, the court decision for Pennsylvania, he sees that the courts are against him in some of these swing states. He looks at the early ballot and he sees that it's a lot of young folk voting, a lot of people who are not his demographic. Uh, voting. Don't, the early ballots are against him. And so what he's trying to do is create enough chaos and hope that he can get a photo finish that he can then allow the Supreme Court to, to bring him home into another, into a second term. Because he knows on the ground, ultimately, if everybody votes, he doesn't win and they lose the Senate. And so he is going to do everything he can to create chaos and crisis to make some Americans even stay home. And he hopes that his cult like base will come out and continue to push him toward victory. And Mark, the, both the pres, both the president and Joe Biden have been repeatedly now in Pen, in Pennsylvania over the last uh, a few weeks. Uh, and uh, Trump often talks about how the suburbs, how he needs the suburbs that they don't uh, they don't show him any love anymore. Could you talk about how the suburbs of Philadelphia have so dramatically changed? I lived there uh, many years ago for about 15 years, and the suburbs there, Montgomery County, Bucks County, Delaware County, Chester County, were almost all white. Uh, what's uh, how have the suburbs around Philadelphia changed in the recent decades? Oh yeah, and it's it's not just uh, it's not just in Philadelphia. All around the country, we've seen uh, suburbs uh, shift. We've seen the suburbanization of poverty. We've seen sort of we've seen people people in the city pushed out because of gentrification and other factors. So a place like Darby or Upper Darby, uh, in, which is right outside of Philadelphia, which may have been white, you know, even 20, 25 years ago, is now largely black, and they're voting Democrat uh, because of a set of and a, there's a set of economic policies that have pushed them there. And so Trump at, at one point would have hoped that yeah I'll lose Philadelphia, I'll lose Pittsburgh, but I'll get everything in the middle of the state, what they call Pennsylvania, and I'll get the suburbs of these urban sites out right outside of Pittsburgh and right outside of Philadelphia. But that's no longer the case. It's not a conspiracy, but rather a set of neoliberal economic policies that have pushed people out. And we have to remember the word suburb doesn't mean white and idyllic. Compton is a suburb. Ferguson was a suburb. And now we see these other places that are suburbs, and they're not serving Trump's interests. But again, Trump's problem is not the suburbs of Philadelphia. Trump's problem is that people in Philadelphia, in Pittsburgh, people in, in within Ohio, people in places like Cleveland are seeing economic policies that have not benefited them. They're seeing they're dying from COVID and their friends are and family members are. They don't have access to living wage jobs. And that's why they're having the problem. But one more thing on Pennsylvania, what you are going to see is an interesting conversation in the middle of the state around fracking. And this is why, um, you know, Trump is coming back. That's why Biden is coming back and trying to walk that tightrope on, on environmental issues, uh, because he understands that the middle of the state may have a very different political disposition than what we're seeing in Philadelphia. And because of that, Pennsylvania could still be up for grabs. I think, I think Biden wins this by a couple hundred thousand votes, but um, it's still up for grabs in terms of, in terms of the political debate. I wanted to end our discussion, not in Pennsylvania, Mark, but you cover police brutality issues all over the country. And I wanted to end in Louisville with this latest development. Um, you have a judge ruling that members of the grand jury can speak.
And so two members of the grand jury convened after the police killing of Breonna Taylor have spoken on camera for the first time, calling the actions of the Louisville officers responsible for Taylor's death criminal. The two jurors say Kentucky's Republican attorney general, Daniel Cameron, never gave them the option to consider murder or manslaughter charges against the Louisville police officers involved in Taylor's killing. The pair had their identities concealed as they spoke to CBS's Gail King in an interview that's airing today. Can I ask you what you both think of the police uh, behavior and actions that night? Negligent. Negligent? They couldn't even provide a risk assessment, and it sounded like they hadn't done one. Um, so their organization leading up to this was lacking. That's what I mean by they were negligent in, in, in the operation. Number two? They were criminal leading up to this and everything that they—the way they moved forward on it, including the warrant, uh, was deception. So, Professor Mark Lamont Hill, can you talk about the significance of this, given that Daniel Cameron, uh, Kentucky's attorney general, who spoke at the Republican convention, when he held his news conference, he said this was an independent grand jury. They made the decision. The only charges that were brought were against one of the white police officers, not for the death of Breonna Taylor, but because uh, some of his bullets went into the apartment of the neighbors who were white. Neighbor. Yeah. It, it, it's 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 disturbing and it's disgusting, but unfortunately, it's not surprising. From the very beginning, we have seen a campaign of prevarication, of dishonesty, uh, of outright just uh, you know neglect of any any semblance of justice uh, for Breonna Taylor or for her family. Uh, when Daniel Cameron came out after the decision was made not to do anything, uh, he had the crocodile tears. He had the explanation that. Uh, all he did all that he could, and he gave us the impression that the that the grand jury was acting independently, that they were simply acting on their own volition, and that they looked at all the evidence and made the best choice that they could. Um, and we always had skepticism. No one believed him. Uh, and now what we have is evidence, hardcore evidence, that proves that. But this does stand to reason, given that Daniel Cameron is a Republican uh, prosecutor who is attempting to leverage. Uh, this moment into a bigger moment. And the way to leverage a bigger moment as a black Republican, quite frankly, is to show that you're willing to lock up black people, that you're indifferent to their suffering, and that you're willing to support the state and specifically law enforcement in cases like this. So he will ascend very quickly. If, God forbid, there were another Trump administration, I wouldn't be surprised to see him as an AG. I mean, that's how far uh, he, he, he could go, given this process. And so, again, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. I'm saying that there's a very clear, there's a very clear angle here politically, and there's hardcore evidence to suggest that Breonna Taylor uh, should have gotten—and let's not call it justice. Justice would be her being alive. But at the very least, there should be some sense of accountability for those who killed her. The, even the grand jurors are saying it. And I think the more we, un, we unravel this, the more ugliness we're going to find. And hopefully, we can get another, another, another crack at this, because this is one of the most sort of gross uh, and disturbing public demonstrations of, of, of injustice in the so-called criminal justice system. Mark Lamont Hill, I want to thank you for being with us, professor of media studies and urban education at Temple University in Philadelphia. His forthcoming book, We Still Hear, Pandemic, Policing, Protest and Possibility. When we come back, we will go to Chile to talk about the precedent-setting vote that just took place for a new constitution. Stay with us.
People United by Inti Ilimani. This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we turn to Chile, where an overwhelming majority voted to rewrite Chile's Pinochet dictatorship era constitution Sunday. One year after mass protests rocked Chile, many hope the historic referendum will lead to changes in social and economic inequalities, address police brutality, expand access to education and indigenous sovereignty. Tens of thousands of people poured into the streets of Santiago and around Chile Sunday evening to celebrate. This is resident Maria Cecilia Castillo. I thought it was a historic day that I wouldn't get to see again in my lifetime. I lived through the yes or no referendum in the first presidential election after many years of dictatorship. It seemed to me that participation was very high, and the most important thing is that the newer generations made their voices heard. We're up for discussion. Political parties and political associations are now institutionally obsolete, and we all have to understand this. So we have to find new paths, and I think that the youth and social organizations are fundamental for this new era. For more on Chile's historic vote to rewrite the Constitution and what happens next, we're joined by two guests. In Santiago, Javier Amanzi is with us, spokesperson for Chile's largest feminist advocacy group. And in Toronto, we're joined by Pablo Vivanco, a Chilean-born journalist, former director of Telesur English. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! We're going to Santiago first, mm -hmm. although both of you got to vote uh, in Chile, as well as in uh, Canada, mm -hmm. as, as a Chilean. Um, Javier Manze, can you talk about the significance, what led to this vote and the results of it, what they mean? Yes. Hi, Amy. Well, first of all, I would like to make a distinction. We finished the constitution that was imposed in 1980 under the dictatorship of Pinochet with a revolt that broke out a year ago, the 18th of October. It wasn't just a vote. The popular victory that we experienced this October 25th marks two preferences with an absolute majority. We voted for a new constitution with a majority of 78,2%. And together with that, we voted for a constituent body that will be made up exclusively by members of this, for this function with a 78,9%. This is a demonstration of a majority that goes far beyond the margins of all post-dictatorship elections a margin never before seen in an election in Chile. For us, this vote marks a desire rooted in the revolt that broke out in, the, in October. We overthrew a tyrant's constitution, but not only that. This is a vote that challenges the continuity for more than 30 years of the neoliberalism implanted during the dictatorship with the Chicago Boys Doctrine uh, shock. Today, we can say that that what, that what political parties of the governments of these 30 years didn't do, the peoples did with the revolt. Who is beyond the, reje beyond the re uh, behind this, the option of rejection? Who loses with this plebiscite with a 21,7%? Those of the 1% concentrated in three, uh, in, in, some, in the communes of the highest income of the country, in Vitacura, in Providencia, in Lovernechea. The same uh, people who voted in 1982-88, yes, for the continuity of the dictatorship. Those of the 1%, those who are the extreme right, those who are also who concentrate the wealth in Chile, those are who are uh, behind the the other option of rejection. Those are the ones who lose, who lost this this, this plebiscite. One of the main Javiera slogans of the revolt. Uh, Javier, was, I wanted to to ask you what were could you talk about what were some of the parts of the old constitution that were most uh, most objectionable and most hated by the population? Uh, could, could talk specifically about what it did to distort uh, the the possibility of democracy in Chile? Well, this constitution uh, that was imposed during the dictatorship was done precisely to protect a model. Uh, it was a constitution done, designed for a, with the implementation of neoliberalism in Chile. So the revolt that started and that we have seen, we have said that the, the neoliberalism will start and end in Chile has, all to, uh, has uh, a lot to do precisely with this change, no? with this desire of a radical transformation and with this necessity to change the 
um, constitu this constitution. In this constitution, there's a lot of uh, makes like, like a institutional framework that has, a, in all sorts of senses, has privatized human uh, social rights. It's a, it's a constitution that also denies for women a right to choose uh, for our own bodies. It's a constitution that um, that guarantees an state, a subsidiary state, where precisely it's not the human rights, it's not social rights that are in the front, but um, other than that, the private accumulation of the of the few. So, of course, this is a a important, a very important um, challenge that we are starting now in Chile. A challenge that for us in the social movements, we know that must be uh, held through with constant mobilization because we know that uh, what starts now is a. a it's a dispute, an open dispute from different sectors, of course, from the from the ones who are going to try to save the continuity of this model, and all, from all of those, from the revolt and the people who are out, uh, nowadays, um, that we have rise precisely to change everything and the forms of how our lives have been uh, precarized, precarized and administrated along these 30 years. Uh, we're also joined by Pablo Vivanco, a Chilean-born journalist and former director of Telesur in, uh, English. Uh, welcome to the program, Pablo. Could you talk about you were able to vote from Canada? Uh, and uh, could you talk about the uh, how the United States has sold uh, Chile uh, as a neoliberal model in Latin America now for decades and the impact of this vote? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, uh, myself, uh, along with uh, Chileans from uh, all over the diaspora in the world, uh, a vast majority of which are folks uh, that left uh, because of the dictatorship, people that were forced to flee for their lives, uh, or other folks like my family uh, who were forced to flee uh, in the 1980s, fleeing the economy, which had bottomed out and, and put working people uh, in a situation where they had to leave. Um, you know, which is another thing which is seldom talked about, because uh, Chile is, like you said, upheld as a model, not only since its return to civilian government, uh, but also throughout the 1980s. Neoliberalism was a disaster in Chile, uh, you know, even well before the 1990s or the current the, the current day. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Chile has been upheld uh, throughout the region as the model to follow. Uh, it's been held as uh, you know, the, the example that if countries uh, follow uh, market-based reforms, if they allow the private sector to uh, do what it wants, then you will achieve some measure of development. And uh, all across Latin America, like in most places that, that I've been to, which is most of the countries in Latin America, invariably you come across uh, people that, that, you know, when they find out I'm, I'm uh, from Chile, uh, they'll say, oh, yeah, Chile Chile's well off, right? And compare it to their own uh, country. Well, now with this uh, vote where, like Javiera said, uh, close to four and five Chileans uh, voted to reject this model, uh, to reject the institutionalization of neoliberalism through the 1980 constitution, and have now also rejected uh, politicians being the ones to draft the next page in the country's history, it really sends a signal throughout the region that uh, the, the, that this selling of the Chilean model uh, and of the neoliberalism, uh, the neoliberal state, uh, is a lie and is something that Chileans know is a lie. Chileans know has failed, and now they've come out and said overwhelmingly that they reject it. This is Chile's president, Sebastian Piñera, responding to the landslide vote to rewrite the Pinochet dictatorship era constitution. Today, Chileans have freely expressed their will to the ballot box, choosing the option of a constituent constitution, which for the first time will have full equality between men and women, in order to agree on a new constitution for Chile. Today, citizens and democracy have triumphed. Today, unity has prevailed over division and peace over violence. And this is a triumph for all Chileans who love democracy, unity and peace, without a doubt. 
So, Pablo Vivanco, I wanted to ask you, there you are in Canada, but you did get to vote, and you voted alongside your parents and your aunts and uncles. For people who aren't familiar with the history of Chile, I mean, you had your own September 11th, September 11th, 1973, when, um, when the democratically elected president of Chile died in the palace as the Pinochet forces rose to power. Um, Pinochet would reign for years, thousands of Chileans killed, and then through Operation Condor, thousands of people around Chile were killed also as a result of the Pinochet dictatorship. Can you talk about how that impacted your family and what it meant for you to vote with your family that had gone into exile in Canada? Well, just to clarify, my, my family uh, wasn't part of the my immediate family. That is, my my parents and myself, my sisters, uh, weren't part of uh, the the exile community. I grew up around uh, the exile community and I had various uh, family members who also were forced to leave. Uh, my family stayed in Chile. Uh, I, I was born under dictatorship. Um, my my mother was working in the hospitals of Santiago, seeing the bodies come in on September 11th. Uh, for obviously myself and uh, my family, as well as the people that I've grown up around, my community here, um, you know, it was a very important. It was uh, something that had a lot of, uh, you know, sim symbolic uh, meaning to be able to uh, go out and vote to finally uh, bury one of the, the last main remnants of the dictatorship. And you mentioned September 11th. It should also be noted that this constitution, the one that Chileans now overwhelmingly voted uh, to uh, just uh, rip up, uh, was passed on September 11th, 1980, uh, which is no which is no coincidence. The, the dictatorship uh, specifically put this plebiscite in 1980, like, like Javier said, something that was imposed on Chileans uh, through, uh, you know, a, a vote. You can't have a democratic vote under dictatorship. Uh, and that's what, uh, what the dictatorship did in 1980, September 11th, uh, when they passed uh, this plebiscite, imposed this constitution on Chile. So if you look at the, the, the diaspora of, of Chilean emigres and, and exiles uh, located in uh, North America or in Europe, Australia, uh, France, Sweden, uh, all the places where the majority of Chileans went to uh, in the 1970s and 80s, fleeing the, the, the human rights abuses and the authoritarianism of the dictatorship or the economic collapse, overwhelmingly Chileans voted also outside of the country uh, to uh, do away with this constitution and to start a new chapter in the country. And Javier, uh, could you talk to us about what this vote means, specifically in terms of grassroots movements, uh, such as the feminist movement uh, in Chile and also the indigenous uh, populations of Chile? Well, for a start, uh, what we voted Sunday uh, begins with the first time in the world history that there will be a constitution that will be drafted for between men and women in equal basis. It will be a part, this means that for the first time, 50% of this constituent uh, organ will be, will be women and the other 50% men. This is historical. And this is uh, a gain of the feminist movement, a gain that has been, because this is the first uh, constituent process that we are holding in, in South America, in Latin America, in this last cycle of feminist politicization and mobilizations. Uh, with, the, with the feminist strikes and with all the massive uh, demonstration of feminism as a protagonist of this moment and of this process. And for us, that is a major concern because we're, uh, our major concern now is knowing that doesn't, it's, it's not um, the 50 percent of women in this uh, process doesn't uh, guarantee that feminism will be a protagonist. For us, it's a uh, it's, uh, um, necessity that feminism is all around, it's, it's in the institutional process, but also outside in the streets, mobilizing this desire and this need for a social transformation. And for us, it's important to uh, protagonize this process with our demands, with our program, with what we've held during the feminist strikes. For the Mapuche movements today, precisely during these hours, there's a and a very important vote that's been uh, in the Congress being uh, discussed. We just because have 10 seconds, Javiera. 
Yes, revolt in Chile is a plurinational revolt. And now there's the, the, they're discussing the possibility of Mapuche people and indigenous people to, have a, a part, a, to participate during, in this convention. Javier Manzi, I want to thank you democracy. so much for being with us, uh, with the Coordinadora Feminista 8M, and also Pablo Vivanco speaking to us from Canada. This is Democracy Now! I'm Mimi Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.